So tonight, um, I've been joking with everybody. I have seven pages of notes. Rest assured, it's not going to be long, but there's just a lot of good material. Tonight, we're going to talk on prayer. We're going to talk about what Jesus taught about prayer. And there's kind of three main areas he touched on. I'm going to try to do it all justice tonight because I think prayer is such a vital component of our lives as believers. And it's such an important discipline to have as we build our relationship with the Father and do, to be able to hear his voice, to do his work, and to receive from him. So the text, we're going to be in a lot in the Bible, so if you brought your Bible, hold on tight. And if later on you guys want my notes, you're like, Brent, there is so much there. Can I look at it later? I have some notes. Just let me know. I didn't want to kill trees tonight. So, um, But the main passages are going to be out of Matthew 6. 5 through 13, and Luke 11, 1 through 3. And both of them are just two different accounts of Jesus teaching the disciples the Lord Prayer and also telling them a parable that illustrates it. And so first I'm going to read what comes out of our, the book we've been reading, and then I'm going to dig into some of the research and some of the things I learned as I was studying for tonight that I think is really interesting and hopefully will help illuminate how you look at the Lord's Prayer and prayer and how you approach it. So... It says the background is the disciples, could, the disciples could tell that Jesus had an unusual prayer life. Sometime he would go off at night to pray, and they would come looking for him later. And when he prayed, things happened. God answered. Miracles occurred. And they wanted to know the secret of how to communicate with God as Jesus did. Do you ever feel like your prayers go no further than the ceiling? Can I just get a witness? All right, we're all on the same page then. Or that your prayers don't have the power God's words say they should have. Again, amen. Or that other people experience more answers than you do. You're reading my mail here. The disciples seem to feel this way too. So they asked Jesus how to pray. And we see an example of that, right? When there was that demoniac they couldn't cast out, right? And they said, why couldn't we do it? And this is kind of in that vein. They're, remember, like I talked back in the Jewish education system, this was their rabbi. They wanted to be exactly like him and do all the things he did. But here's something. We tried to do what you did, and it didn't work in the way we saw you do it. We thought, we, you know, A plus B equals C, right? This didn't happen. And in that case, he said, these can only come out with prayer and fasting, which I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But again, you see this theme of, Okay, Master, there's something we're missing. What's next? Help us to understand. And that's how we should be as followers of Jesus, right? Like, okay, Lord, sometimes I'm feeling like my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. What am I missing? Holy Spirit, reveal it to me. And in fact, I'll have um, Kimberly share a little bit later because she said something earlier tonight when we were talking about forgiveness that I was like, ooh, that's good. So, anyways. da 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 as you listen to his answer, see if he emphasized the same aspects of prayer that you do when you pray. How closely do your prayers line up with his? How do your attitudes about prayer fit the attitudes he described? One day, after Jesus finished praying, one of his disciples asked him to teach him how to pray. After all, John the Baptist had taught his disciples about prayer. And if you remember, Andrew was one of John the Baptist's disciples before he came to follow Jesus. There's another one, and I can't remember who, and Lonnie will tell me in a little bit because Lonnie knows all. James? Um, I know Andrew for sure. I thought there was a second, but maybe it was Philip. I think you're right, Philip. Um, anywho, not really important. Is, but not. Um, Jesus' disciples, Jesus' disciples wanted to learn too. So Jesus gave them an example of what prayer should include. You know, I'll say it with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but to leave us, deliver us from the evil one. Yeah, for yours is the power and the glory and forever and ever. The actual, the oldest um, examples of Matthew's um, 
gospel don't have that part, so there's a lot of debate on whether or not that was in it or not. But that is a good addition. Um, but, but delivers from the evil one. Jesus told his disciples not to pray like, pray like the hypocrites. In other words, don't try to impress other people or to be seen as spiritual. People who do that already have their reward, which is the opinion of others, right? We see this with the Pharisees, you know. Thank you, Lord, that I am not like these other people, da 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 He's got his reward, mostly in his ego. But um, people who do that already have the reward, the opinions of others. Real, real prayer is the kind you would do if you were in private. God sees what is done in secret and rewards it. Jesus also said not to go on and on with repetitive words as if getting God's attention depends on the number of words you speak. We're here for quality, not quantity. He already knows what we need even before we ask. Then Jesus told a story to illustrate this. Imagine a traveler going on a long journey arrived at the home of his host late at night. He said, the host has nothing to feed his visitor and not wanting to be rude, he goes to a neighbor at midnight to ask for some bread. But the neighbor has already turned off the lights and gone to bed. Don't bother me, he says. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. But this man keeps on knocking persistently. And because of his boldness, the neighbor, the neighbor finally gets up and gives him as much as he needs. Jesus said the point was this. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. In other words, the prayer will be answered one way or another. And the answer will be good. Jesus pointed out that no good father gives his child a snake when the son really asks for a fish. No father would give a scorpion instead of an egg. So if imperfect human fathers would give good gifts to their children, certainly God would give good gifts to his children. And will, he'll especially give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks him. So in doing my research, there are a couple places I went, and so I'm just going to say up front, a lot of this is borrowed. I go to people who are a lot smarter than me, a lot in my professional life and my spiritual life, and so a couple of men that are a lot smarter than me wrote some really good stuff, and I want to share that in my summarization of my thoughts. Is that okay tonight? All right. So in the fire bubble, how many of you have a fire Bible? This is a good thing. I love this book. There's an article called Effective Prayer. And so if you go into your fire Bible, there's an Effective Praying article. You'll see, oh, this is where Brent got it, and you can read it for yourself. But he talks about the reasons for prayer, the requirements of effective praying, and the methods of effective praying. And so I want to dig into that a little bit, have a little bit of discussion, and then I want to go into further kind of breaking apart the Lord's Prayer. So first, the reasons for prayer. Number one, God commands his followers to pray. And you see that through many places in the Old Testament and the New. I didn't make bookmarks, so bear with me. First, in Amos chapter 5. Let's see, uh, Amos chapter 5, verses 4 and 6. So for thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, do not enter and go, go, blah, blah, blah. Seek the Lord and live lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph. Seek the Lord, prayer. In Luke 18, and in Ephesians, we see Paul talk about praying. God wants us to pray, to pray, not to prayer, to pray. Number two, it connects us to God's power and purpose. And we see this in numerous places in the world where prayer is being necessary for God to act. One, Pentecost. They were in the upper room and they were praying and the Holy Spirit was poured out. The example I used earlier, driving out certain types of demons along with fasting. And then you see it also many other places, but the other example I found was you know, numerous requests from apostles like Paul and Peter saying, please pray for us. Because they understood that intercessory prayer was important for their missions to be effective. They couldn't do it without prayer, which is the same reason why we pray for our missionaries, why we pray for Lydia, why we pray for Pastor Paul and Amy, because prayer is an important component of working and doing God's will. Three, God has made his followers also to be co-workers in the effort to lead people into a personal relationship with him. This part was really interesting to me because I hadn't really thought about it like this before. But, you know, it illustrates there are many things that will not happen until people pray. 
um, it's like God has almost limited himself because he wants us to partner with him and what he's doing. And so, I said there's a lot of scripture tonight. Exodus chapter 33. Do, 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 do. Here we go. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speak to a friend. When Moses turned again into a camp, his assistant John the son of Nun, jo- Joshua the son of Young, son of Nun. I cannot talk tonight, guys. I'm sorry. A young man would not depart from the tent. Let's see how that one. I must have gotten something mixed up there. I'm sorry, guys. The second example I had was in Matthew chapter nine, where it says, "Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers in the harvest." We need to pray so that people would be risen up. So we work in concert and petition with God and some of the mission of what he's doing on earth. And I think that's a cool honor, right? He wants us to be a part of what he's doing. He could do it all without us. But not only did he create us, he saved us to have a relationship with us, but then he wants to work with us and through us. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. That was another example, and I should have put that in. That was a better example than Exodus. Exactly, though. If my people humble themselves and pray, then I will do this. If my people pray, then I will. And so it's that whole partnership. So some of the requirements of effective praying. First of all, we must have a true and sincere faith that God hears our prayers, and he has the ability to accomplish anything that anything and that he will do what he, is no, what he knows is best in the situation. We have to have true and severe, sincere faith. In Mark chapter 11, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received and it will be yours. So it isn't enough just to say, hey God, you know, I, I'm not feeling good, I don't know. Can you heal me, make me feel better? That's not true and sincere faith, right? It's, God, you are the healer, you are the great physician, and I know that you have a perfect plan of will, and if it is within your will, please use your power to heal me tonight, right? Or heal so-and-so, or to do this and that. True and sincere faith. Prayer should be made in Jesus' name. And it's not just enough to say, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's important, but that's not, it's not like the magic stamp on our prayers. Because when that was written in biblical time, people understood that when you did something in somebody's name, you did it with their approval, and you did it with their authority. And remember how we talked a couple months ago about authority. So it's literally saying, as a representative of Christ Jesus and with his blessing and his authority, let it be. Because amen means let it be. Okay? So, it meant their approval and authority. In John, we see this. If I had more time, I would have had the scriptures pasted in, but I ran out of time, and I'm sorry, folks. On 14, 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. In my authority, in my approval, anything you ask. Third, the third requirement, it needs to be within, in harmony with God's perfect will. I can sit here and pray in the name of Jesus, I'm gonna get a new car. Yeah, not so much, right? But in the name of Jesus, I want people in union to be saved. I want people to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want sick people to be healed. Those are things that are in line with God's perfect will. And when we have a close relationship with, with the Father and prayer and a healthy prayer life, our desires will be molded by his desires. Right? If I'm asking for cars and material and whatever type selfish blessing, 
I'm probably not in a very close relationship with God if I'm only thinking about myself, right? And so our prayers need to be in harmony with God's perfect will. They need to be done while living in God's perfect will. If I'm out cheating on Stephanie and hitting the bar on Saturday nights and doing all this, that, and the other, should I expect God to answer my prayers? Absolutely not. And he says so in his word. Right? So does it mean we have to do good works so that God would hear us? No, that's not what I'm saying. But if we're blatantly and knowingly sinning, we might need to do a little self-check if we feel like we're hitting the ceiling. And uh, like I said, I'm not perfect. I'm not cheating on my wife, by the way. <laughs> no. I'm married up and I know it, so <laughs> way up. I do. So anyways, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes, right? We're going to sin. That's not the point. We don't have to be perfect for him to hear our prayers, but we need to be trying to live within his will, okay? And then we must be persistent. Now, does persistent mean that, hey, God, hey, God, hey, God, hey, God, hey, God? No. Anybody who's seen the Big Bang Theory knows what I was not into. God, God, God. Um, but he gives us examples, right? The persistent widow gives us ask, seek, and knock, and all of those things where he shows that, you know, we need to be, as, and really it's, it's not so that we're just constantly asking, but if it's coming to our mind, instead of worrying on it, even after we prayed for it, Lift it up again. That's persistence. It's really about continually putting that concern back into God's hands. Persistently. Because our flesh tends to want to come back and say, remember that thing and you think and you kind of mull on it. Maybe you worry about it. Hey, I've got that meeting with boss on Monday. Uh, I don't know. Those type of things. Persistence is just consistently offering it up to God. So what are some methods for effective prayer? So I'm going to kind of throw this out. I have some things listed up, but let's just see. I like this to be interactive. What is necessary for effective prayer? Mm-hmm. Private room. Okay. I need to go in a private room. But, but broader than that, okay, because we can pray in public too, but our most effective prayer is in. But what else? What else is needed for effective prayer? Mm -hmm. We must genuinely praise and adore God. That's actually the note I had. Mm -hmm. Put him in a place of adoration. What else? Mm-hmm. Yep. There's something else. Possibly. That's not necessarily a requirement, though. And I'll get into that in a minute, but that's a good thought. In, in public, yeah. You know, praying out loud when we're in a, in a corporate setting, it's good because we build up each other's faith. There's something, and I think about the end of that service, when, remember on Sunday before you guys were here, for those of you who were here when I said, we did at the end of men's retreat, we did a session, a little part at the, at the end of altar time where we said, let's worship like we, if God was coming back in the next three minutes, how would you worship? What I didn't say, because I didn't want to take forever, was we did it once singing the song that we were doing for altar time, and then we did a second time with no music, and everybody just prays on their own. And can I tell you, that was cool. It really was. Because it literally, it literally was like the sound of rushing waters. Of just everybody, just men lifting up their voices and praising in their own words. So out loud is a good thing. And it's not, but it's not an exclusive, this is the only way to do it, right? 
Another one is done with sincere thanksgiving. We don't always approach God for, hey, I got this need, give me, give me, give me, give me, right? I mean, because if, if our kids did that, and granted, my kids usually only come to me when they want something, but if there isn't thanksgiving, I'm not as likely to want to give in to what they want, depending on the situation. I give you and it doesn't mean anything. It's the same thing with our father. Sometimes we need to just stop, and sometimes I make a point of praying personally, and I don't ask him for a thing. I just thank him. God, thank you. God, thank you. Another one is sincerely confessing our sins. We all mess up. All mess up. And so, and God already knows, so let's just get that out of the way. Hey, God, you know what? I was, I was really proud with Stephanie this week. And it caused me to get angry because she called me on something and this didn't really happen, but it has happened, so it's a good example for me to use. I'm Brent, I have control issues. Um, so anyways, and those type of things where you're like, okay, God, and you just confess it and there's just something freeing about that. He already knows, but it's like, it's off my chest. I've, I've asked forgiveness to my wife. It's dealt with on a human level, but hey, God, I sinned against you in this too. You know what? I got haughty. I got angry. I had pride, right? We ask what we need without hesitation. So when we do ask, we don't ask with hesitation. Oh, God, could you please? The board says to boldly approach the throne of grace. So when we're... When, we're, when we confessed our sins and we have praised him and we have thanked him and we've acknowledged who he is and, and realized who we are, which is what? Children of God. We should walk up like we would our dad. Hey, Father, I have this need. Can you help me out? Boldly a throat, approach the throne of grace. And then when we pray for others, pray with passion. And this is, I mean, I will always say this. Whenever I teach, there's, it's, there's a mirror right there. You guys don't see it, but there's a mirror right in front of me. I'm talking to myself too, so I don't pretend to be any better than anybody else, and I'm not. But we should pray with passion for others. Love, you, love others as yourself. I will pray passionately for myself. I should pray equally as passionate when passionately when I'm praying for Bobby if he's sick or if I'm praying for Kimberly when she's, you know, got stuff going on with Athena or whatever, you know. All of you, we should pray passionately for each other as if we were praying for ourselves. How should we pray? As, what are some, some of the components of how we pray, the physical act of prayer? How do we pray? Humbly with sincere hearts and not a bunch of empty words. Humbly. We go for quality, not quantity. And that's what he's saying. You know, do not pray like the Gentiles do who think by their many words, God will hear them. I have an employee. He's a good employee. I like him. But he's one of those people that uses a thousand words when 10 will do. You know, and I will, there's many times I'll stop him like, Jim, you sold me like two minutes ago. Stop, I'm on board, I'm good, you know. But there are those people, right, that you know in your life that just, you, 100 words would it do, but you, you talk for 10 minutes. Like, goodness gracious, stop. So I wonder if sometimes we're like, oh, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, and Lord God, and the Lord God, and the da, 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 and God's like, really? Get to the point. Not that he's that rude, but you wonder sometimes. You can pray silently or aloud. There's no right way to verbally or internally pray, right? He just wants us to do it. I think there's a certain component to praying out loud that kind of pushes your faith a bit. And it definitely put, stretches you as a Christian, especially if you're like me and you're introverted. Yeah. I mean, there's... 
Yeah. And that's great. It's a great witness. It's a fantastic witness. So yeah, but there's nothing wrong if, if you're silently, if you're in a moment of, you know what, just quickly in my head, Lord, please help. Hey, Lonnie, I'm sorry. I'm looking down here and I'm not even seeing you. Uh-huh. Yes, very true. So praying out loud eliminates distraction. Uh huh. Yeah, praying out loud, praying the scripture builds you up. And if you're like me, I got the ADD. It's good to pray out loud, right? Because I'll be, you know, Lord God, thinking. This is my internal dialogue, Lord, thank you. You know, I wonder about that meeting tomorrow. And uh huh. Yeah. We can pray in our own words, and we can use scripture. Right. Even fixed prayers, there's nothing wrong with a fixed prayer. Saying the Lord's Prayer, there's nothing wrong with saying it. It's really about the heart. You know, I won't begrudge the Catholics. Catholics are very liturgical. They pray fixed prayers. And there's nothing wrong with it. It becomes wrong when it becomes rote, routine, and mindless, and all of that. Just saying it to say it. That's just right. You know what, Carla, I really appreciate when you come to my small group and just bring the food that, and all of that. It's just so wonderful. I can, I can go southern when I want to. I can go southern when I want to. So, um, I want to keep moving because we're already at 7.15 and I want to relieve the kids. Um, so, I'm going to kind of speed through some stuff here. We can do it in our heart language, English, or in our spirit language. We can even do it with groaning, right? Sometimes you're just so upset and all you can do is just, oh, God. He can work with that. We can sing. Chris, uh, Chris Kimberly, too many Ks. Kimberly does this a lot. Um, and I've always kind of admired that about her. I don't have that, abil- that talent so much. I'm not confident enough to, to pray singing, but um, I saw that and I thought of you. And then deep prayer. If we're praying about some really he- weighty matters, consider pairing it with Fasting. You know, that one demon couldn't be cast out without fasting and prayer. It was a heavy spiritual need, you know. And so fasting isn't always necessary food. It generally, is the most common. But fasting is essentially giving up something so you have more time to focus on the Lord. It's depriving your flesh of something and then taking whatever time and focusing that on God. It's almost a bit of a sacrifice. So, okay, finally... What posture is best? Is it best to stand, sit, kneel, cartwheel? Exactly. Whatever. There's no right way. As long as it's not distracting from what you're doing, there's no right way. Now, I will throw in that sometimes it's good to change up your posture. I have found sometimes that when I need to pray a little more passionately, pacing and walking kind of helps me get in a rhythm of really digging in, but if I want to, if I'm dealing with something internally and I want God's help with, kneeling at the altar is, is where I feel most connected. So sometimes a posture will change depending on what the situation is. Okay, so the next thing I looked into, I'm really sorry, but we're gonna, we're gonna go through this as fast as I can, 
It was an article I found on the AG website, and it said, the Lord's Prayer, the essence of Jesus' model prayer in the context of first century Judaism. And I like this article because too often I know I look at the Bible through the eyes of somebody in the 21st century. Right? And I look at all the context in the light of what I understand and know. But so much of what happened and so much he taught, he taught in the context of first century and their customs and what they understood. So it's helpful to us, especially to me, because I'm a history nerd, but to look at it and say, okay, help me understand the context and how they would have looked at it. And so um, I thought this was interesting. I hope you guys do too. Um, the Lord's Prayer was taught in the context of first century Jesus, Jewish prayer. I just said that. In the second temple period, so after the return from the, the exile in Nehemiah and Ezra, they rebuilt the temple. That's called the second temple period. Um, we see the arrival of synagogues and the Hebrew education system, along with public liturgies of prayer and reading from the Torah. So in the synagogues, they even had liturgies where they had fixed prayers. They had fixed things they did. Um, because after being exiled... You know, they, they didn't want to get kicked out again, and they got their act together. And I thought that was kind of interesting, because the first time, they were worshiping other gods, right? And then they get exhaled. And then the second time we see where Israel's messing up, they've gone too far the other way, and you've got gross legalism. And Jesus has to set that straight. So it's kind of funny how the pendulum swung in ancient Israel. <laughs> We, we see in the ancient literature from time period that fixed prayers were part of the expression of worship. However, it was emphasized, and like I said, the fixed prayers not become routine, but done with a sincere heart. The most prominent of these fixed prayers that is still used today, and I'm going to butcher this, is the Shimona Estra, or also called the Amida. It contains 18 benedictions, which a benediction is just a bestowing a blessing. We, call, we think of it as the ending of something because it's usually done at the end of a service, but it actually means to bestow a blessing. To benedict is to bestow a blessing on somebody. And so there's 18 benedictions that were prayed, that are prayed three times a day. Because of its length, some of the rabbis offered condensed versions that still allowed the people to fulfill their obligation. And we'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to try to do this fast, but this is the Amidah. And I want you to listen as well as you can and see if there's some things that jump out to you. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and revered God, God most high, generous, kind, owner of all things. You remember the pious deeds of the patriarchs, and in love will bring a redeemer to their children's children for your name's sake. O King, helper, Savior, and shield. Blessed are you, O Lord, the shield of Abraham. Number one. O oh Lord, you are forever mighty. You bring, back, you bring back the dead to life. You have the power to save. Out of loving kindness, you sustain the living. And with great compassion, you revive the dead. You support the, failing, the falling, heal the sick, free the captives, and keep faith with those who sleep in the dust. Who is like you, Lord of mighty deeds, and who may be compared to you? O King, who brings death and life and causes salvation to spring forth. You are to be trusted to bring back the dead to life. Blessed are you, O oh Lord. Who revives the dead? Two. They memorize this, by the way. You are holy, and your name is holy, and holy, brings, holy beings praise you every day. Blessed are you, O Lord, the holy God. Some are short. You favor mankind with knowledge and teach mortals understanding. Favor us with the knowledge, understanding, and discernment that come from you. Blessed are you, O Lord God, O Lord, gracious giver of knowledge. Turn us back, O Father, to your Torah. Draw us near, o, o our King, to your service. Bring us back in perfect repentance to your presence. Blessed are you, O Lord, who delights in repentance. Forgive us, O Father, for we have sinned. Pardon us, O our King, for we have been disobedient. For you pardon and forgive. Blessed are you, O Lord, ever gracious and ready to forgive. Look at our misery, champion our cause, and redeem us swiftly for your namesake, for you're a mighty redeemer. Blessed are you, O Lord, the redeemer of Israel. That was seven. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us and we shall be saved, for it is you we praise. Send us complete healing for all our ills, for you, O divine king, are a trustworthy and compassionate physician. 
Blessed are you, O Lord, who heals the sick of his people Israel. O Lord our God, bless this year and all its varied produce for our good. Send a blessing on the earth, satisfy us with your goodness, and make this year as blessed for us as former years. Blessed are you, O Lord, who blesses the years. Sound the great horn for our freedom, raise the banner to rally our exiles, and gather us in from the four corners of the earth. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gathers the dispersed of his people Israel. Restore our judges at first, our counselors as in former times. Remove from us sorrow and sighing. Rule, us, rule over us, O Lord, you alone, in kindness and compassion, and vindicate us in judgment. Blessed are you, O Lord, the King who loves righteousness and justice. That was 11. For slanderers there may be no hope. May all wickedness perish in an instant. May your enemies be swiftly cut off. Uproot, smash, overthrow, and humbly, swiftly in our days, and humble swiftly in our days the arrogant kingdom. Blessed are you, O Lord, who breaks the enemies and humbles the arrogant. Towards the righteous and the pious, towards the elders of your people, the house of Israel, towards the remnant of their scholars, towards the righteous proselytes, and towards us may your compassion be stirred. O Lord our God, grant a rich reward to all who sincerely trust in your name. Set our portion with them forever so that we may not be put to shame, for we have trusted in you. Blessed are you, O Lord, the support and security of the righteous. Did I mention they memorized this? Whew. To you, Jerusalem, your city, return in mercy and dwell in it as you have promised. Rebuild, rebuild it soon in our days as an everlasting structure and swiftly establish it in the throne of David. Blessed are you, O Lord, who rebuilds Jerusalem. Bring the Messiah. Cause the sign of David, your servant, to spring up swiftly, the Messiah, and let his horn be exalted through your saving power. For we wait for your salvation all day long. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the horn of salvation to flourish. Hear our supplication, O Lord our God. Spare us and pity us. Receive our prayers with compassion and favor. For you are God who listens to prayers and petitions. O our King, do not turn us out of your presence empty-handed. For you hear with compassion the prayers of your people Israel. Blessed are you, O Lord, who hears prayer. I'm getting close. O Lord our God, receive with pleasure the people, your people Israel and their prayer. Return the, service, return the service to the sanctuary of your house. Accept with love and approval the fire offerings of Israel and their prayers. And may the service of your people Israel be ever pleasing to you. May our eyes witness your return to Zion. Blessed are you, O Lord, who brings back his Shekinah to Zion. We give thanks to you, for you are the Lord our God and the God of our fathers forever and ever. And you are the rock of our life, shield of our salvation in every generation. We will give thanks to you and praise you for our lives that are held in your hand, for our souls are in your care, for your miracles are, that are with us every day, and for your wonders and your benefits that we experience every moment, morning, noon, and night. You are, you are all good, and your mercy has no end. You are all compassionate, for your kindness knows no limit. We, will all, we have always put our hope in you. For all this, O our King, may your name be continually blessed and exalted forevermore. May all that lives give thanks to you and praise your name in sincerity, O God, our salvation and our help. Blessed are you, O Lord, whose name is all good and to whom it is proper to give thanks. So according to this article, there's one more stanza, but I really need to move on. According to Mark Turnage in this article, the Lord's Prayer was modeled very closely to the Samada. You guys notice that? And so it was, was likely viewed as Jesus' condensed version for his disciples, for them to pray daily. Now, this wasn't the only way he taught them to pray, right? But when they were asking about, teach us how to pray, he gave them a structure. And to them, in their perception, they would say, oh, yeah, other rabbis do this for the followers too. This is the Abedah. But it's, here's the bullet points. Because you hear a lot of kind of, I don't want to say repetition, but Con consistent themes as you go through it, right? And so the Lord's Prayer is all of that kind of condensed into one, one thing. And so, one, our Father in heaven. By identifying God as Father, the biblical authors recall the fact that we are God's creation and his children, and we have a responsibility to obey him and follow all his ways. Two, may your name be sanctified. Hallowed be thy name. This was not a statement of praise and exaltation, which is interesting because that's how I've always heard it taught. Rather, the Hebrew phrase behind the Greek of the Gospels is best rendered, may your name be sanctified. According to Ezekiel, God sanctifies his name by his actions, both the Old Testament and, 
ancient Jewish literature indicate that God's people sanctify his name by the way they act. Whenever people obey his commandments, they sanctify God's name. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. First, heaven does not refer to a location. Another interesting piece. Rather, during the Hellenistic and Roman periods, so the time period we're in with Jesus, 3rd century B.C. to about 3rd century A.D. was when the Romans were over everything. Jews avoided articulating the name of God or the divine name. They spoke about God uses, using other words. The glory, the omnipresent, the place, heaven. Thus, the kingdom of heaven is no different from the kingdom of God, as the phrase appears in Luke's gospel. Second, kingdom, as in the English, denotes a physical place. In the Hebrew, however, the word kingdom is a verbal noun and better is translated as reign or rule. So instead, kingdom of God is the rule of God or the reign of God. The phrase, may your kingdom come, would be better fra- paraphrases, may you continue establishing your reign. Does that make sense? You guys tracking with me? I'm talking really fast, so... Um, So at the outset of Jesus' model of prayer, at the very part, he teaches his disciples to pray like this. May your name be sanctified. May your your reign be established throughout our obedience and submission to your will and commandments. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's that, okay? Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus drew the conclusion, drew what was a radical conclusion of the time, that to seek one's provision beyond the day the current day express anxiety and worry. And you see that in his parables, right? Do you see the lilies of the, of the field? Do you see the sparrows, right? Beyond today, if you're worrying about tomorrow, if you're thinking about tomorrow's provision, you're worrying and anxiety, and Jesus said, don't worry about it. Your God knows what you need. In part, this worldview was born during the Exodus, right? When they got manna, how much manna did they get? Enough for the day. And if they got more than enough for that day, what happened to it? It rotted. So even in the Old Testament, we see where God's teaching, trust me for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. I got you. All right? By making obedience to the will of God a primary goal of one's life, a person does not need to be anxious about the cares of life. For the one who worries about the cares of life misunderstands the character of God our Father. I love that sentence. That's not my own. That's the author's. Um, Because what verse do we think of when we hear that? Seek ye first righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Forgive us as we have forgiven. Jesus enjoins his disciples to pray, forgive us as we have forgiven. In other words, our forgiveness from God depends on the forgiveness we show others. I'm going to mow that row again. Our forgiveness from God depends on our forgiveness to others. So if we're bearing on forgiveness, you might want to get that worked out because you're going to have to answer for it. Our forgiveness from God, we're not forgiven of our sins if we don't forgive others their sin. And that's not a pleasant truth, but there's no way to sugarcoat that. It's the truth of God. And Kimberly, I wanted you to share that part there, but we're like out of time. Kimberly just made a point that, you know, when she sits there and she thinks about forgiving others, and she's like, I don't think of anybody who sinned about me. She asked God, hey, God, is there somebody I need to forgive? And he will plant things in her head of like, you know, and she used... You know, examples, some politicians and things like that. Like, so, right? And then finally, and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So a better translation would be, in not, and do not bring us into the grasp of temptation. God doesn't lead us into temptation, but he's like, hey, put up the guardrails before I get there. Do not bring me into the grasp of temptation. Keep me out of reach. Temptation's reach is what he's saying. People are tempted because evil inclination rules over them. If God will deliver us from the rule of evil inclination, then he will deliver us from evil, which causes temptation. So 
lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil is a restatement, right? It's keep me from temptation's grasp and help me overcome the evil nature within inside of me that leads me into temptation. So it deals with the desire and the root of that desire. So that is all I have. And I was going to do some time to pray, but I don't want to keep Bill and poor Denise stuck with the kids. So let's pray. Does anybody have any prayer requests before I pray? Jordan's like, is it broken or is it hurt? Hematoma. Okay. But it sounds painful. <laughs> Groovy. We will pray. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, that's right. You're leaving for Oklahoma. Okay. Pray for Robin's mom. What was her name? I'm sorry. Teresa. Okay. What's that? Okay. Billy's transmission. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much. For-